Cost of Living by Robert Sheckley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tabithat. Cost of Living by Robert Sheckley. Karen decided that he could trace his present mood to Miller's suicide last week, but the knowledge didn't help him get rid of the vague, formless fear in the back of his mind. It was foolish. Miller's suicide didn't concern him. But why had that fat, jovial man killed himself? Miller had had everything to live for—wife, kids, good job, and all the marvellous luxuries of the age. Why had he done it? "'Good morning, dear,' Karen's wife said as he sat down at the breakfast-table. "'Morning, honey. Morning, Billy.' His son grunted something. "'You just couldn't tell about people,' Karen decided, and dialed his breakfast. The meal was gracefully prepared and served by the new Avignon electric autocook. His mood persisted, annoyingly enough, since Karen wanted to be in top form this morning. It was his day off, and the Avignon electric finance man was coming. This was an important day. He walked to the door with his son. "'Have a good day, Billy.' His son nodded, shifted his books, and started to school without answering. Karen wondered if something was bothering him, too. He hoped not. One warrior in the family was plenty. "'See you later, honey,' he kissed his wife as she left to go shopping. At any rate, he thought, watching her go down the walk, at least she's happy. He wondered how much she'd spend at the A.E. store. Checking his watch, he found that he had half an hour before the A.E. finance man was due. The best way to get rid of a bad mood was to drown it, he told himself, and headed for the shower. The shower-room was a glittering plastic wonder, and the sheer luxury of it eased Karen's mind. He threw his clothes into the A.E. automatic clean-presser, and adjusted the shower-spray to a notch above brisk. The five degrees above skin-temperature water beat against his thin white body. Delightful! And then a relaxing rub dry in the A.E. auto-towel. Wonderful, he thought, as the towel stretched and kneaded his stringy muscles. And it should be wonderful, he reminded himself. The A.E. auto-towel, with shaving attachments, had cost three hundred and thirteen dollars plus tax but worth every penny of it, he decided, as the A.E. shaver came out of a corner and whisked off his rudimentary stubble. After all, what good was life if he couldn't enjoy the luxuries? His skin tingled when he switched off the auto-towel. He should have been feeling wonderful, but he wasn't. Miller's suicide kept nagging at his mind, destroying the peace of his day off. Was there anything else bothering him? Certainly there was nothing wrong with the house. His papers were in order for the finance man. "'Have I forgotten something?' he asked out loud. "'The Avignon electric finance man will be here in fifteen minutes,' his A.E. bathroom wall reminder whispered. "'I know that. Is there anything else?' The wall reminder reeled off its memorised data, a vast amount of minutiae about watering the lawn, having the jet-lash checked, buying lamb chops for Monday, and the like. Things he still hadn't found time for. "'All right, that's enough.' He allowed the A.E. autodresser to dress him, skilfully draping a new selection of fabrics over his bony frame. A whiff of fashionable masculine perfume finished him, and he went into the living-room, threading his way between the appliances that lined the walls. A quick inspection of the dials on the wall assured him that the house was in order. The breakfast dishes had been sanitized and stacked, the house had been cleaned, dusted, polished, his wife's garments had been hung up, his son's model rocket-ships had been put back in the closet. "'Stop worrying, you hypochondriac,' he told himself angrily. The door announced, "'Mr. Pathis from Avignon Finance is here.' Karen started to tell the door to open when he noticed the automatic bartender. Good God, why hadn't he thought of it? The automatic bartender was manufactured by Castile Motors. He had bought it in a weak moment. Hey, he wouldn't think very highly of that, since they sold their own brand.' He wheeled the bartender into the kitchen and told the door to open. "'A very good day to you, sir,' Mr. Pathis said. Pathis was a tall, imposing man, dressed in a conservative tweed drape. His eyes had the crinkled corners of a man who laughs frequently. He beamed broadly and shook Karen's hand, looking around the crowded living-room. "'A beautiful place you have here, sir, beautiful. As a matter of fact, I don't think I'll be overstepping the company's code to inform you that yours is the nicest interior in this section. Karen felt a sudden glow of pride at that, thinking of the rows of identical houses in this block and the next and the one after that. 
"'Now, then, is everything functioning properly?' Mr. Pathis asked, setting his briefcase on a chair. "'Everything in order?' "'Oh, yes,' Karen said enthusiastically. "'Avignon Electric never goes out of whack. "'The phone all right? Changes records for the full seventeen hours?' "'It certainly does,' Karen said. He hadn't had a chance to try out the phone, but it was a beautiful piece of furniture. "'The Solido projector all right. Enjoying the programs?' "'Absolutely perfect reception.' He'd watched a program just last month, and it had been startlingly lifelike. "'How about the kitchen? Auto-cook in order? Recipe master still knocking them out?' Marvellous stuff! Simply marvellous! Mr. Pathis went on to inquire about his refrigerator, his vacuum-cleaner, his car, his helicopter, his subterranean swimming-pool, and the hundreds of other items Karen had bought from Avignon Electric. "'Everything is swell,' said Karen, a trifle untruthfully, since he hadn't unpacked every item yet. "'Just wonderful!' "'I'm so glad,' Mr. Pathis said, leaning back with a sigh of relief. "'You have no idea how hard we try to satisfy our customers. If a product isn't right, back it comes, no questions asked. We believe in pleasing our customers.' "'I certainly appreciate it, Mr. Pathis.' Karen hoped the A.E. man wouldn't ask to see the kitchen— he visualised the Castile Motors bartender in there like a porcupine in a dog-show. "'I'm proud to say that most of the people in this neighbourhood buy from us,' Mr. Pathis was saying. "'We're a solid firm.' "'Was Mr. Miller a customer of yours?' Karen asked. "'That fellow who killed himself?' Pathis frowned briefly. "'He was, as a matter of fact. That amazed me, sir. Absolutely amazed me. Why, just last month the fellow bought a brand-new jet-lash from me, capable of doing three hundred and fifty miles an hour on a straightaway. He was as happy as a kid over it. And then to go and do a thing like that! Of course the jet-lash brought up his debt a little. Of course. But what did that matter? He had every luxury in the world. And then he went and hung himself. Hung himself? Yes, Pathis said, the frown coming back, every modern convenience in his house, and he hung himself with a piece of rope, probably unbalanced for a long time. The frown slid off his face, and the customary smile replaced it. But enough of that. Let's talk about you. The smile widened as Pathis opened his briefcase. Now then, your account. You owe us two hundred and three thousand dollars and twenty-nine cents, Mr. Caron, as of your last purchase, right? Right, Caron said, remembering the amount from his own papers. Here's my instalment. He handed Pathis an envelope, which the man checked and put in his pocket. Fine. Now you know, Mr. Caron, that you won't live long enough to pay us the full two hundred thousand, don't you? No, I don't suppose I will, Caron said soberly. He was only thirty-nine, with a full hundred years of life before him, thanks to the marvels of medical science. But at a salary of three thousand a year, he still couldn't pay it all off and have enough to support a family on at the same time. "'Of course we would not want to deprive you of necessities, which, in any case, is fully protected by the laws we help formulate and pass. To say nothing of the terrific items that are coming out next year, things you wouldn't want to miss, sir.' Mr. Caron nodded. Certainly he wanted new items. "'Well, suppose we make the customary arrangement. If you will just sign over your son's earnings for the first thirty years of his adult life, we can easily arrange credit for you.' Mr. Pathis whipped the papers out of his briefcase and spread them in front of Karen. "'If you'll just sign here, sir.' "'Well,' Karen said, "'I'm not sure. I'd like to give the boy a start in life, not saddle him with—' "'But, my dear sir,' Pathis interposed, "'this is for your son as well. He lives here, doesn't he? He has a right to enjoy the luxuries, the marvels of science.' "'Sure,' Karen said. "'Only—' "'Why, today, sir, the average man is living like a king. A hundred years ago the richest man in the world couldn't buy what any ordinary citizen possesses at present. You mustn't look upon it as a debt. It's an investment.' "'That's true.' Karen said dubiously. He thought about his son and his rocket-ship models, his star-charts, his maps. Would it be right? he asked himself. What's wrong? Pathis asked cheerfully. Well, I was just wondering, Karen said. Signing over my son's earnings, you don't think I'm getting in a little too deep, do you? Too deep, my dear sir! Pathis exploded into laughter. Do you know Mellon down the block? 
"'Well, don't say I said it, but he's already mortgaged his grandchildren's salary for their full life expectancy. And he doesn't have half the goods he's made up his mind to own. We'll work out something for him. Service to the customer is our job, and we know it well.' Karen wavered visibly. "'And after you're gone, sir, they'll all belong to your son.' "'That was true,' Karen thought. "'His son would have all the marvellous things that filled the house.' And after all, it was only thirty years out of a life expectancy of a hundred and fifty. He signed with a flourish. Excellent, Pathis said. And, by the way, has your home got an A.E. master operator? It hadn't. Pathis explained that a master operator was new this year, a stupendous advance in scientific engineering. It was designed to take over all the functions of house-cleaning and cooking, without its owner having to lift a finger. "'Instead of running around all day, pushing half a dozen different buttons, with a master operator, all you have to do is push one. A remarkable achievement!' Since it was only five hundred and thirty-five dollars, Karen signed for one, having it added to his son's debt. "'Right's right,' he thought, walking Pathis to the door. "'This house will be Billy some day, his and his wife's. They certainly will want everything up to date.' Just one button, he thought. That would be a time-saver. After Pathis left, Karen sat back in an adjustable chair and turned on the Solido. After twisting the easy dial, he discovered that there was nothing he wanted to see. He tilted back the chair and took a nap. The something on his mind was still bothering him. "'Hello, darling,' he awoke to find his wife was home. She kissed him on the ear. "'Look!' She had bought an A.E. sexitizer negligee. He was pleasantly surprised that that was all she had bought. Usually, Leela returned from shopping laden down. "'It's lovely,' he said. She bent over for a kiss, then giggled, a habit he knew she had picked up from the latest popular Salido star. He wished she hadn't. "'Going to dial supper,' she said, and went into the kitchen. Karen smiled, thinking that soon she would be able to dial the meals without moving out of the living-room. He settled back in his chair, and his son walked in. "'How's it going, son?' he asked heartily. "'All right,' Billy answered listlessly. "'What's the matter, son?' The boy stared at his feet, not answering. "'Come on, tell Dad what's the trouble.' Billy sat down on a packing-case and put his chin in his hands. He looked thoughtfully at his father. "'Dad, could I be a master repairman if I wanted to be?' Mr. Karen smiled at the question. Billy alternated between wanting to be a master repairman and a rocket pilot. The repairmen were the elite. It was their job to fix the automatic repair machines. The repair machines could fix just about anything, but you couldn't have a machine fix the machine that fixed the machine. That was where the master repairmen came in. But it was a highly competitive field, and only a very few of the best brains were able to get their degrees, and although the boy was bright, he didn't seem to have an engineering bent. "'It's possible, son. Anything's possible. "'But is it possible for me?' "'I don't know,' Karen answered as honestly as he could. "'Well, I don't want to be a master repairman anyway,' the boy said, seeing that the answer was no. "'I want to be a space pilot.' "'A space pilot, Billy?' Leela asked, coming into the room. "'But there aren't any.' "'Yes, there are,' Billy argued. "'We were told in school that the government is going to send some men to Mars.' They've been saying that for a hundred years, Karen said, and they still haven't gotten around to doing it. They will this time. Why would you want to go to Mars? Leela asked, winking at Karen. There are no pretty girls on Mars. I'm not interested in girls. I just want to go to Mars. You wouldn't like it, honey, Leela said. It's a nasty old place with no air. It's got some air. I'd like to go there, the boy insisted sullenly. I don't like it here. "'What's that?' Karen asked, sitting up straight. "'Is there anything you haven't got? Anything you want?' "'No, sir, I've got everything I want.' Whenever his son called him sir, Karen knew that something was wrong. "'Look, son, when I was your age, I wanted to go to Mars, too. I wanted to do romantic things. I even wanted to be a master repairman.' "'Then why didn't you?' "'Well, I grew up. I realised that there were more important things. First I had to pay off the debt my father had left me, and then I met your mother. Leela giggled. 
and I wanted a home of my own. It'll be the same with you. You'll pay off your debt and get married the same as the rest of us. Billy was silent for a while. Then he brushed his dark hair, straight like his father's, back from his forehead and wet his lips. How come I have debt, sir? Karen explained carefully, about the things a family needed for civilised living and the cost of those items, how they had to be paid, how it was customary for a son to take on a part of his parents' debt when he came of age. Billy's silence annoyed him. It was almost as if the boy were reproaching him, after he had slaved for years to give the ungrateful whelp every luxury. Son, he said harshly, have you studied history in school? Good. Then you know how it was in the past. Wars. How would you like to get blown up in a war? The boy didn't answer. Or how would you like to break your back for eight hours a day doing work a machine should handle? Or be hungry all the time? Or cold with the rain beating down on you and no place to sleep? He paused for a response, got none, and went on. You live in the most fortunate age mankind has ever known. You're surrounded by every wonder of art and science, the finest music, the greatest books and art, all at your fingertips. All you have to do is push a button. He shifted to a kindlier tone. Well, what are you thinking? I was just wondering how I could go to Mars, the boy said. With the debt, I mean. I don't suppose I could get away from that. Of course not. Unless I stowed away on a rocket. "'But you wouldn't do that?' "'No, of course not,' the boy said, but his tone lacked conviction. "'You'll stay here and marry a very nice girl,' Leela told him. "'Sure I will,' Billy said. "'Sure.' He grinned suddenly. "'I didn't mean any of that stuff about going to Mars. I really didn't.' "'I'm glad of that,' Leela answered. "'Just forget I mentioned it,' Billy said, smiling stiffly. He stood up and raced upstairs. "'Probably gone to play with his rockets,' Leela said. "'He's such a little devil.' The Karens ate a quiet supper, and then it was time for Mr. Karen to go to work. He was on night shift this month. He kissed his wife good-bye, climbed into his jet-lash, and roared to the factory. The automatic gates recognised him and opened. He parked and walked in. Automatic lathes, automatic presses, everything was automatic. The factory was huge and bright, and the machines hummed softly to themselves, doing their job, and doing it well. Karen walked to the end of the automatic washing-machine assembly line to relieve the man there. "'Everything all right?' he asked. "'Sure,' the man said. "'Haven't had a bad one all year. These new models have built-in voices. They don't light up like the old ones.' Karen sat down where the man had sat and waited for the first washing-machine to come through. His job was the soul of simplicity. He just sat there, and the machines went by him. He pressed a button on them, and found out if they were all right. They always were. After passing him, the washing machines went to the packaging section. The first one slid by on the long slide of rollers. He pressed the starting button on the side. "'Ready for the wash,' the washing machine said. Karen pressed the release and let it go by. That boy of his, Karen thought, would he grow up and face his responsibilities? Would he mature and take his place in society? Karen doubted it. The boy was a born rebel. If anyone got to Mars, it would be his kid. But the thought didn't especially disturb him. Ready for the wash, another machine went by. Karen remembered something about Miller. The jovial man had always been talking about the planets, always kidding about going off somewhere and roughing it. He hadn't, though. He'd committed suicide. Ready for the wash? Karen had eight hours in front of him, and he loosened his belt to prepare for it. Eight hours of pushing buttons and listening to a machine announce its readiness. Ready for the wash? He pressed the release. Ready for the wash? Karen's mind strayed from the job, which didn't need much attention in any case. He wished he'd done what he'd longed to do as a youngster. It would have been great to be a rocket pilot, to push a button and go to Mars. End of Cost of Living by Robert Sheckley